original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day is about the value of tradition, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, the new traditional farming practices, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition into your life. And today's show, we're going to talk about how did cheese get started? First of all, I'm going to give you just a few farm updates. Then I'll talk about the history of cheese all the way to the present time. Uh, Brief, very brief. And uh, we'll have our recipe for, for this podcast. So the farm updates. I don't have a lot to report about the farm, a bit about hay, the creamery, and a story about the goats and their antics. So let me start with the hay and the creamery. Scott finally laid the first row of blocks for the walls of the creamery. Yay! Now he's off today getting more hay, but he'll be back at it tomorrow and every day as long as the weather holds. And uh, yeah, we work long hours around here. They are shorter during the winter due to the amount of daylight, and as the days get longer, we'll get more and more done on any given day. So those walls are going to be going up. But why is he getting more hay? As I've talked about, our cows are 100% grass-fed and raised on pasture, and they get stored grass in the winter. That's the hay. Cows need a lot of energy to stay warm when it's cold, though they handle the cold very well. But they eat more, sometimes a lot more, when it's really, really cold. And we came up short on the amount of hay we needed due to the excessive cold this winter. They're eating a lot more uh, to keep warm. And that brings up another quick point that I want to make. We endeavor to have two years of hay stored for just this reason. You never know when you're going to run short. Now, perhaps this year we will get that hay storage back up to snuff. It was there a couple of years ago. Uh, Sometimes these things just slip when other priorities demand our attention. You know, it's a daily juggling act. I think we're passable jugglers at this point, but uh, we still need some improvement. Now, the goat antics. Uh, We had yet another case of unauthorized breeding on the farm a little over five months ago. Here's the story. After manifest evidence of unauthorized breeding, Scott looked to his calendar of events for more information, and he found uh, an incident on his calendar that explained the situation. I didn't even know it happened. It was a small blip, and he corrected it immediately. So let me back up a little bit. We essentially maintain two herds and flocks of animals. One we call the boys, and the other is referred to as the girls. Even though there are a couple of the boys in with the girls right now, that's our authorized breeding in progress. Unauthorized breeding happens when the boys meet the girls on their own schedule outside of our desired parameters. And as I said, we had an incident a little over five months ago. So, uh... What happened was every morning during milking season, we bring up the girls, usually just the bovine species, only we only milk the cows, not the sheep or the goats. However, sometimes the animals come up the path also just for kicks and in order to say hi to us. And according to Scott's calendar slash diary on September 30th last year, when he was returning the cows to the pasture, After morning milking, he noticed that a couple of the girl goats had joined the boys. And with goats, you never know how they get through a fence. But believe me, if there's a way to get through a fence, a goat will find it. So the goat kids. Scott got the goat girls back with the rest of the girls herd. And the renegade girls were in there for 
for no more than half an hour, maybe 45 minutes that they were in with the boys. It just doesn't take long, does it? Fast forward to about two weeks ago, Scott was checking the herd and putting out hay, and he noticed several goat babies running around out there. Of course, this had to be a day just before freezing cold was to come again. And uh, there you have it, only 30 to 45 minutes and five months later, goat kids. Scott came and got me, and we began goat kid rescue operations, get them to shelter. And immediately, I found a set of badger-marked twins uh, from one uh, gray badger-colored doe. But Scott had mentioned that on first arriving with the hay, his first clue was he had seen a tiny black kid trailing after one of the black does. So we searched, and we searched, and we searched for a couple of hours, but we could not find this kid. Uh, And goat kids are exceptional at hiding and camouflage. Scott finally decided he must have been mistaken. Now, we both had trouble accepting that because it is really hard to mistake one of those tiny newborns for the grown ones, even if it was one of the smaller does from last year. But after a couple of hours of looking in every nook and cranny we could find, we did give up the search. Uh, Then the next morning, Scott came and got me again. This time, he's holding a tiny black goat kid. God only knows where that kid was hiding. Uh, We reunited him with his mom, and and he seemed pretty happy about that. He was larger than the twins. You know, we believe he could have been a day or even two days older than the others. Or also, a single birth as opposed to a twin makes for a bigger kid. We estimated the weights of the twins at three and a half and three pounds. See how tiny? And the single was a bit over four pounds, we think. So then, with the joy, we also suffered a little bit of loss And the story has a bit of a sad ending. The black one was running around fine for two days, and then we found him dead one morning. And I don't know what happened. Perhaps he was stressed from a night away from his mom and was immunocompromised. Maybe he got too cold just that one night, and and it weakened him just enough. We don't know. Goat kids are extremely vulnerable in their first week. And on a happier note, the twins are doing spectacularly. Those are the only two kids we will have this year, knock on wood. We didn't plan on having any. Um, There's also a nagging thought in the back of my mind that in another week or so we could have a few more. I'm not sure that we separated the baby boys from the herd before the oldest buckling was sexually active. Well, I'll let you know if anything changes there. And while I'm on the topic of births, I'll mention a couple of other things. Like I said, No more goat kids this year. We paused on breeding the goats this year because we are evaluating whether we want to switch from cashmere goats for fiber to meat goats. We're looking at Kiko goats, which are a meat breed. We're uh, not growing any more goats until we make a decision about pressing forward with our original fiber plan or deviating slightly to the meat plan. Now, the, the sheep and cows... As far as the sheep go, the ewes were bred on schedule and are due to deliver sometime after March 20th. We will move them to the pasture outside my living room window as their time gets closer. They are strong in birthing on pasture, but keeping our eye on them is important. Taking excellent care of our animals is high on our list of priorities. And we will supplement their hay just a little with mineral fortified feed two weeks ahead of their expected delivery. Um, losses, heartbreak, and experience have led us to that added step. We expect our first calf on March 30th, and the good Lord willing and the creeks don't rise, we will have five healthy calves this year with no vet bills. All right, switching topics. Let's move on to the history of cheese. I don't know if you think about things uh, that we have and do today. How did they evolve over time? Uh, From time to time, I ponder it. Throughout my life, I've had a penchant for history and tradition. But just how did we come to the place where we are today? How did this or that method or tradition come to be? Why is it always done that way? Here's a deep one I've thought about. How did humans figure out that traditional committed pair bonding between two individuals 
led to a stable family and continuation of the species. Who figured out why that worked? And what were the traditions passed down through generation after generation to ensure that it happened? What about soap making? That's a chemist endeavor. What brain came up with that method? But today I want to talk about the path of our ancestors that led to preserving milk and making cheese, also significantly contributing to the survival of the species. I'll share and pass on some tales about how it might have happened, and a bit about where we are today as some traditions fall away and others evolve. When did people first begin to make cheese? Well, the most repeated story is that it was discovered by nomadic peoples, people who traveled by foot or beast of burden, horse, donkey, or camel. And the story goes that they found that the milk they transported in bags made of animal stomachs solidified during the long day of jostling along on the back of a, a horse or a donkey. Young ruminant animal stomach is the key there, calves, kids, and lambs. And uh, while that may be the most oft-told story, it's not the only way cheese may have evolved. We know that it doesn't take a camel trip to cause milk to curdle. The rennet in the stomach of the ruminant will do that for sure. But leaving a bowl of milk sitting outside any hut or tent for a couple of warm days will do the job. You separate the curds from the whey, and voila, cheese. I'll provide greater detail on that process going forward, but that's the basics. Warm the milk, add rennet, or let the natural aliveness of the milk do its thing on its own. Drain the whey, cheese. Now, moving forward in time, um, let's talk about the monastic and small town cheese traditions. I'm going to quickly move through the Greco-Roman area, uh, era, which produced actually produced documentation of cheese making. Cheese was an important food for the people of Greece and Rome. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the monasteries rose to prominence, and they were responsible for the survival of education and culture after civilization deteriorated with the fall of Rome. The monasteries perpetuated and protected the documents, uh, the cheese documents, and additionally, additionally, early medicines were developed in uh, rud rudimentary pharmacies. You saw important advances in art, music, and cooking. The monks were generally the most ed educated in that period of history. They were the landowners, and the country folk of the land were their responsibility. Monks tended to the spiritual needs of the people as well as their health and the process of growing, preparing, and storing food. The monasteries became a prominent developer and keeper of cheesemaking tradition. It was during this time that regional and distinct types of cheeses first arose, uh, maintaining a thriving small industry using the milk produced on church-owned land was central to the survival of the community. Monasteries used local labor and ingredients. Peasant farmers and herders also made cheese from the milk of their sheep, goats, and cows to feed their families. Um, cheese was one answer to the question of what to eat in the season when no milk was available, and traditional methods were developed. Also, isolated valleys existed throughout Europe and were home to local societies with traditions and foods that were unique to their small worlds. Many still exist and have influenced the wonderful variety of European cheese that we have today. There are hundreds of these cheeses passed down from generation to generation that are still available today. And many still are operating under a type of patent uh, related to the tradition. The cheese must be made in a specific region with milk obtained from a specific cow breed and processed using specific methods to be labeled with a specific name. Camembert de Normandy and Parmesan are two examples. Now, industrialization came along in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as urban society grew and food for more and more people was needed, cheese making was gradually taken over by industrial concerns able to produce huge amounts of cheap cheese for distribution over larger and larger distances. Um, because industrial production was able to mass produce cheese for masses of people at lower cost, 
it almost wiped out the market for small producers and cheesemakers. Mass production led to centralized industry and regulatory bodies. Why? Because quality is often sacrificed for quantity. Large quantity operations open the door for unsanitary conditions and unsafe manufacturing processes in an effort to save time and money. More people are involved, more places where contamination can occur. So the next logical step is enforced and costly regulation for sanitary and production standards. This makes it less and less profitable for artisans to continue. Their small operations do not have the same sanitation and manufacturing issues though they are still required to pay the price and they don't have the same monetary resources. One exception is France, which because it started with a very large artisan community, it was able to maintain a presence in the field. However, even now the European Union is gradually instituting policies that are difficult for some farmstead producers to comply with, leading them to give up their craft. As we move forward with technology, handcrafted products made with love and devotion and the accompanying tradition sometimes get left behind and the tradition becomes hidden away like a fine painting stored and nearly forgotten in a closet. As with most developments in society, there are positive and negative sides to industrialization. Today, there is a revival of people like us who are wondering if something value has valuable has been lost in that process. We're looking into that closet and retrieving the priceless art stored there. The desire for transparency in food production is becoming a public demand. The desire to know the composition of our food is probably the biggest reason we started on the path of making all of our own food. We wanted to know exactly what we were eating. Perhaps you do too. And let's talk about the environmental impact. Long distance transportation carries a high cost to the environment. Our, farm, our farmer's market and many more like it attract those who desire more and more to choose locally grown and artisan produced food over imported and industrial produced foods. A product lovingly crafted by hand costs more, but it's not about the money, is it? It's about the physical health of our families, the economic health of our communities, the humane treatment of living creatures, and conservation of the planet we inhabit. We're seeing growing interest in our craft. Every year sees an increase in artisan cheese consumption, though the number of us small-scale cheesemakers is still quite small. It isn't easy being cheesy, but we want you to be able to experience the taste of fresh handmade cheese and discover the joy of creating a wonderful food made from a simple ingredient, fresh milk. So that brings us to the present day. Now let, let me just throw in a couple of, uh, again, you have traditions and some things that you do or you say and you don't know why. So here's some cheese trivia. The terms big wheel and big cheese. Those originally referred to uh, those who were wealthy enough to purchase a whole wheel of cheese. Big wheel and big cheese. Number two trivia. Cheese was once used as a currency in medieval Europe. Cheese and other agricultural products were regularly used to pay the church taxes. Some, quote, tithe barns. Those are ancient buildings where the portion owed to the state land owner or church was collected. Some of those tithe barns still exist. All right, today's recipe. The recipe for today's podcast is lemon cheese. Now, lemon cheese is a very simple, fresh cheese that you can easily make in your kitchen. It's a moist, spreadable cheese with a hint of lemon taste. If you make it in the evening, the rich and delicious cheese will be ready to spread on bagels or hot croissants for breakfast in the morning. The ingredients are simple and the steps are few. Let me first provide a list of equipment you might want to gather. A five quart pot, stainless steel, glass or ceramic is best. Any food thermometer that measures 165 degrees, a large spoon, a fine strainer or colander and butter muslin. 
a clean old t-shirt will do in a pinch. Uh, but the drain process could be a little bit more tricky with that. You can um, ask me about that in the, in the comments if you need some help with that. All right, the simple ingredients and the simple steps. The ingredients, there are three. A gallon of milk, two large lemons, and salt. Now for the milk, do not use ultra pasteurized milk. It's not going to set up. Do not use ultra pasteurized milk. And your organic milk is going to be ultra pasteurized. So either go with conventional milk or find some raw milk in your area. Maybe you have raw milk yourself. The, the lemons, if you don't have lemons, you can also use a quarter cup of lemon juice. So it's two large lemons or a quarter cup of lemon juice. And then you'll need some salt. All right, the steps. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Six steps here. All right. You're going to warm the milk to 165 degrees, stir it often so as not to scorch the milk. Then you add the lemon juice to the milk, stir and set it aside for 15 minutes. Now what you're looking for, the warm milk will separate into a stringy curd and a greenish liquid whey. Curds and whey. It should be clear, not milky. And if you didn't get a good set, you can add more lemon juice if, if your milk didn't coagulate. All right, so you've got your, you heated your milk, you put your lemon in, you set it aside for 15 minutes. Line a colander or a fine strainer with the butter muslin. Pour the curds and weights into that colander. Now pick up the four corners of that cheesecloth and bring it up and tie it into a knot and you're making a hanging bag of curds. And you're going to let that drain for an hour or so or until it reaches a desired consistency. Think spreadable cream cheese. Once you've uh, drained it an hour or so, remove the cheese from the cloth, place it in a bowl, add salt to taste. And that's usually going to be about a quarter teaspoon. And you can also add herbs if you like, like fresh dill comes to mind. Then you're going to be able to store it in a container in the refrigerator for up to a week. That's it. Enjoy. The recipe link is in the show notes and you'll also find it on the website. Well, actually, if you click the link in the show notes, it will take you to the recipe on the website. All right. I hope you enjoyed the farm updates. Follow us on Facebook at Peaceful Heart Farm for some cute pictures of those goat kids. Did you learn some new things about cheese? The traditional methods we used to make our artisan cheese evolved from those roots. And let me know how that lemon cheese went for you. Feel free to ask me questions and provide feedback on your results. Leave us a comment on our Facebook page, again, at Peaceful Heart Farm. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.